I guess initially with Selmodla we were using uh, experimental parameters that we could derive either from published work or our own work and then the emergent behaviour was came out of that, okay. of the physical model. But as we're moving into plant systems, we're um, more explicitly using, say for example, a, a good example is with the Marcantia, very simple asexual propagules which undergo development under the microscope. You can get very good quantitative data for cell geometries and uh, properties that you can map onto that process. And trying to describe geometries in ways that you can classify interactions yes. is important to us. So we're using graphlet type approaches to formalize the description of cell interactions. And grouping just one grouping different different patterns, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's quite it's an early stage in the work, but I think that's really important and to think of more creative ways of trying to integrate genetic properties and yes. physical properties yes, and dynamics. And by the way, I have a, a comment to make, <laughs> since we are in uh, EHES. There's a group uh, in France, actually, and in Germany, trying to use category theory, and we know it's birthplace here, uh, trying to model uh, those graphs, how the more formal tool. How do you code that? Especially in plants, one must... What, you have to have a certain coding of the networks. Mm -hmm. How do you code them? This is yes. your question. Because it has, to, it has to code the information which you need. Well, I think that depends a little bit on the data that you're using and the abstraction. Some of it's 2D abstractions of three-dimensional data, like surface projections. <coughs> uh, and you're, we're making, at this point, simplifications as fast as we can to, to try and identify keys or things that are recognizable and to get correlates, essentially, that we can then explore further. So, Because a lot of it is dynamic. And it's not obvious by just inspection. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So in your in one of your simulations with the um, reconstruction of a mechanism of morphogenesis for plants, uh, we'd like to know if you have used uh, epigenetic information to reconstruct these mechanisms or not. Yeah. Yes, the, the question was about uh, whether epigenetic information has been included in yeah. in some of the models, and I think. Well, in a way, because we're using genetic markers in some cases, which are governed not just by genetic but also epigenetic constraints, so some of those you know, epigenetic information is implicit in what we're measuring, uh, but not explicit at this point. But having said that, one of the nice things about Marcantia is that it has a very streamlined genome, and I don't get into details, but these very primitive plants have very little genetic redundancy. So often, unlike in higher plants where you have large gene families associated with, say, often cell or other specializations, in Marcantia they're very streamlined and straightforward. Um, and some of the, the RNA metabolism and other machinery associated with epigenetic control is accessible for mutation. And we have things like CRISPR-Cas9 techniques for knocking genes out or modifying genes directly. So there's a whole range of experiments which are suggesting themselves to start modifying directly the mechanisms for epigenetic modification in ways that might be help. You know, so there's an integration of a system where you can measure things directly, but also manipulate some of the information that's feeding into the system, particularly epigenetic information. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any questions from the audience? Yes, when you show the, the, the video of the growing plants, uh, can you imagine, do you think that there is a principle of like a least action principle when it grows? So, so did you say least action? Least action principle, like variational formulation. Of what? what uh, uh, minimization of the... Like you better, better define it for the poor biologist. Big question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like a ray, when you, a uh, uh, light ray, want to, to, to minimize both time and energy. Product you know, in physical science, everything can be derived from more purchase or, or least action principle. I, I, I have no idea of how to answer that question. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason for that. Yes, we said, I thought we had the answer to this question. Why? What's the reason you have to ask this question? Because uh, it's uh, like a Feynman uh, proof. Put every quantum dynamics all together into least action principle. No, no, it's only in physics, only only high. And you can <laughs> do the same with anywhere else. Yeah, it's completely because you can do the same. Hmm? Because you can do the same in biology. Why? No. Why? For, 
Absolutely, there is no reason for me to because because nature. Well, you could say, if, if, if I may just, because this is a personal interest, yeah, uh, in the literature, there are some people in France and in, in the US who have been trying to do so. In France, for example, there is a searcher called Gilbert Chauvet, he's died now, who's been trying to find an, a, sort, a sort of equivalent fundamental principle, and he found something related to self-organization, trying to have a definition, highly debatable, like a living organism, a living complex system, is something that basically conserves the service it does to its environment. And by doing so, it organizes itself. So he found something like orgotropy, which is very close to negotropy from Schrodinger, but it's highly debatable. It's highly, highly, highly debatable. It's more people coming from theoretical... No, because actually, yes, I know why I asked the question, because at some point on your slide you said at the beginning, uh, you know, it's not only a DNA, but uh, it's not only uh, necessary to know the code. The coding, is, uh, there is more than the coding. And there are, there are self-signaling, which is important, networks. Mm -hmm. And then there is a, how the, and you say also that it's like in economic political networks. And uh, as if the global behavior is optimizing itself like a, like a, like a least action principle in nature, when the storm is going down, uh, it's like it's following the least action, and uh, you don't know why. As if the storm knows exactly where to go, and I was wondering if that's the same in biology. From well, an epistemological point of view, it would be very elegant, but it's <laughs> an open you question. You have chemical potentials, you have mechanical uh, uh, ener uh, 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 energies, you could use it in some ways, it's done for the hydro, for instance. And is your, is your uh, uh, plant something like the hydro of, of, of plant? In terms of regeneration? Yeah. Uh, but just getting back to your question, I mean, I think from the biology perspective, there's this issue of just taking a rather pragmatic approach, which is the systems are to be optimised because they, they're evolved systems. So there's an eco economy there. But I guess what we're really focusing on is trying to get a handle on the mechanisms because they're things we can measure, things that we can get our hands on. Uh, and the idea that we can grapple with some of the emergent processes and try to find uh, principles or underpinnings. So for example, uh, you know, from a pragmatic point of view, trying to identify genetic motifs that will play out in a cellular context to create processes which are recognizable, the kind of modules that you see in genetic networks but played out in a cellular context, for example, say a module that will create some kind of <coughs> self-propagating process, cellular process, or create some kind of bifurcation, a branch, or a terminated process. They're the kind of things that we're thinking of now. The question of optimization, I hope that will come out in the end. Like reverse switch, you know, the, in the nature you have a, the, the system is going back to, uh, to the jet, to the gene expression, you can modify gene expression using an environment, I believe, huh? and um, this is on this line, uh, I was asking the question. But, uh, but again, you know, in physics, everything comes down from the Turian formulation of invariance, and the real question behind your question is what are the invariants in living systems, which is a massive open question. Now, maybe uh, another question for everybody, not only for, for Jim. <laughs> Please do, please do. Is there another question for Jim? Ah, okay. <laughs> you have shown, in the, in fact, in the beginning of your uh, presentation, you have shown a slide where you have then a, a relationship very direct between chemical information and morphogenesis. It is the second and third slide. So you, so you have two, one cell, and then you say that as in plants, this cell they don't move too much. There is a direct relationship, and you mark two arrows between <coughs> this cell and the morphogenic development. Can you elaborate more about this? If I recall correctly, it's it's a diagram which shows <coughs> a single cell yeah. and a time sequence. Exactly. So a cell that might be programmed to divide, <coughs> and the, the two cells that are the two daughter cells then cause a breaking and addition in exactly. information in the system. <coughs> so I guess it's trying to represent that... Um, oh, it's a representation of it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's not the genetic mechanism. Well, I think that there's a relationship... What the, what the slide is trying to represent is the relationship between the genetic information. So you have a field 
like in the time-lapse image of the pitcher plant, you'll have a million cells. They're all isogenic, so they have the same DNA program, and yet there must be some mechanism from starting from a single cell, and as the cells proliferate, to elaborate different states of gene expression. And so the breaking of symmetry and the creation of, of those different states has to be somehow very precisely programmed. And then that, and so there's clearly a linkage between the genetic processes which encode that. But it, so, so I think a lot of people in ge the genetic field tend to think still of the genome as a blueprint, as that describing the endpoint, rather than describing the trajectory. So all those cells are undergoing different trajectories and that the relationship, the, the, the governing of those trajectories, the splitting of paths in an information sense is governed by cell-cell interactions. So that's what that diagram is trying to represent. Yeah. And I think that in a way Turing's ideas, you know, his uh, morphogenesis uh, based ideas, the, the kind of simple interactions, noise, diffusion, etc., are the kind of things that play here. So the, the kind of exchange or movement of signals, <coughs> the separation, the creation of asymmetries by simple processes but played out in a population are what gives rise to the complexity of the system. I, I have a question for Anne about the boundaries of the uh, operon-like structures. Uh, we would expect <coughs> that if you have a pathway that is linear this could work to some extent, that if, uh, if you have a branch pathway, then uh, because of the branching, you may have more than one owner or one genomic locus that should uh, own the, the genes. And, uh, and therefore, I would like to know uh, if you have looked at, at the, let's say, the genomic structure from this point of view, that is, if you have a long pathway but it is linear, it should still be within an emperor. But a shorter one, which is branch, may belong to different uh, genomic loci. Is there is any relation mm -hmm. between those? That's a very good point. I mean, I, I think, so my, my speculation is that these clustered pathways are insulated from the rest of metabolism. And that's why when we have mutants in those genes, we get a phenotype, because normally there's redundancy, there's a mess. But these pathways seem to be insulated. And there's a really interesting question around what constitutes a clustered pathway in terms of the starting point. And I used to think that it was very simple as a bifurcation with primary metabolism, for example, as I was showing you with the triterpenes. But if you look at the very nice paper from Ian Graham's lab on the noscopene cluster from Poppy, that's a 10-gene cluster that is dedicated to the synthesis of noscopene. <coughs> I've been drawing a figure for a review where <coughs> I've got the whole alkaloid pathway in Poppy mapped out, and making noscopene is only one part of that. There's no publicly available Poppy genome sequence, but um, the first step in that pathway is not a branch point with primary metabolism, it's probably the siphoning off from that network. So it'd be really interesting to know if and when the poppy genome sequence is available, where all those genes are, and whether the parts of the, the not network, the parts that are dedicated to specific end products form discrete clusters. So it's a really interesting question. Also a question for Anne. So you um, mentioned that there might be a, uh, a co-expression going on. Is there any common transcription regulator known for these clustered genes? Because, I mean, uh, I guess the distance between these genes is too large, that one large transcript is formed like in comparison yeah. with an operon. Yeah, yeah. so these, these are not operons. The genes are, you know, we're pretty confident the genes are independently <coughs> transcribed. The intergenic distances vary depending <coughs> sorry, on the genome size. So the bigger the genome, the bigger the intergenic distance, which in itself is interesting. So there's no periodicity that we can see at that level. Um, I didn't mention transcription factors because hardly anything is known for any of the pathways that I've mentioned, which is quite surprising. <coughs> there are, uh, there's a transcription factor for the rice diterpene clusters, but it's not specific to the clusters. It also regulates upstream metabolism. There's one um, very nice example for a, a cluster from cucumber, uh, which has been reported. Um, 
But apart from that, we need to know more. I mean, we're looking for transcription <coughs> factors, and so are other people. I should say that in filamentous fungi, which of course are also eukaryotes, and which have lots and lots of gene clusters for natural product synthesis, including penicillin, you quite often, but not always, find a pathway specific, a gene for a pathway specific transcription factor in the cluster. We're not seeing that. Question for Anne, just to follow up, and Francois asked it in the previous video. So, uh, you observe this uh, cluster for this uh, particular uh, special metabolites, and as I, as I understood, the uh, TS synthetases are, um, are enzymes that uh, might exist in many copies as, as homologs. You know, do you observe some kind of sequence similarity on the, on the, on the genomes of uh, monocots? So, for the genes within these clusters? So with, with the whole genome, with, with yeah. the whole genome, I guess the whole genome. So, so certainly, you know, for the genes in the oak cluster, we pretty much have a template paper that we, we use where, for example, the gene for the first step in the pathway is a distant relative of cyclooctanol synthase. They use the same substrate. Similar structure of the compound. Yeah, so that gene has arisen either directly or indirectly from primary metabolism and has then diversified. And all of the genes within our cluster, they all belong to multi-gene families because that's what specialized metabolism is. But they've gone off and done their own thing. They're divergent members. They're generally they're the founder members of a new subgroup that's you know, where you can find sequences, not the same, not closely related sequences, but phylogenetically a group. <coughs> and they're probably all doing different things. Yeah, so just to follow up, complementary, excuse me. So, uh, the the co-clustering of uh, the synthetase with the uh, cyto cytochrome mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, cytochrome genes is it is it a specific example of the monocots? So mm -hmm. you observe it only on the grasses and not in the dicots. So in the dicots you observe some more. Uh, so does it have to do? Is it like did I, did I get it right for your uh, <coughs> last slides? But uh, this co-clustering of monocots. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm not. Uh, Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're, <coughs> what yes, you're asking. The, the, the co-localization of the uh, terpenoid synthetase with yes. the cytochrome gene yes. is something that you observe more in the monocots. No. You observe it in the dicots too. These are all, they're not the same genes, they're not the same sequences, yeah, but yeah, there, yeah, are, yeah. there are many, many examples. So I showed the mining of the 17 plant genomes. Yes, yes. There are lots and lots of examples. Okay, so, so you observe it everywhere, but, but then you observe some, some uh, you, you saw also some specific uh, example from the dicots only, if I remember correctly, and not from the grasses. No, they're everywhere, they're everywhere. Okay. So the difference was in the, when the, the, the sequence comparisons yeah. for the terpene synthase P450 gene pairs, the point that I was making there is you can find those across <coughs> the monocots and the dicots, um, and that includes the known clusters and also new clusters. But what seems to be happening um, is that those in the dicots, the terpene synthase P450 gene pairs are kind of duplicating okay. like that. Whereas in the monocots, it's all mixing and matching, which suggests something really interesting in terms of microsyntony and recombination, at least as we've looked at it. Sorry. Oh, I have a question for Anne. Uh, it's rather naive. You show a picture of um, you have a picture of the promoter being expressed in the root tips of uh, Arabidopsis and rice. Uh, do you think that this promoter will work, uh, say, suppose in the shoot of the plant also, or is it uh, super specific? For no, it's it has exactly the same or pretty much exactly the same expression pattern in diverse plant species as it does in oat. And in oat, it's specifically in the epidermal cells of the root meristems and the lateral root initials. So this is very strange how a recently evolved pathway has acquired an ancient regulatory mechanism. And it also means it provides a readout that we can use to look at plant development across. We're now going back to, we've been doing some Marcantia uh, work. We're not quite sure whether the promoter is doing anything in Marcantia at the moment, but we're going back from higher plants to towards the, the, uh, the lower plants to see if we can delineate where this breaks down. One last question. Question for Anne. Uh, from your comparative study of the 17 genomes and the clusters, 
Did you bring out a sort of a, a favorite scenario for the evolutionary uh, dynamics of these clusters? Uh, can they disappear? Well, that's the whole, that's another thing, the, um, the birth, life and death of clusters. So uh, there's a whole population genetics argument around this, which I'm still trying to get to grips with. Um, but presumably, once the clusters lock into place, they're optimised, they're delivering a selective advantage. There must be massive selection to drive these things together. Um, but then, when they become no longer necessary, <coughs> do they disappear completely? Do they, do they break up? There are examples, which I didn't go into, of split clusters, which are still operational. So the maize dimboa, the hydroxamic acid cluster, Wheat and rye also make hydroxamic acids, but the genes are split into two subclusters there. So the, the hypothesis is there was an ancient translocation event that occurred after maize and wheat and rye separated that split. Nevertheless, it's interesting that the pathway still works. That's, that's one thing. And the other interesting thing is whether once something perhaps has become established and becomes indispensable, so it's essentially no longer specialised, if that happens, then could those genes be welcomed into the genome? Was there ever a point when the <coughs> anthocyanin pathway genes were clustered, for example? <coughs> so okay, I propose to thank our speakers again for their <coughs> presentation this morning.